Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Janine Basha, and I work with Develop Nova Scotia, and I'll be your moderator for this evening. Um, today, we're going to dig into Peggy's Cove. So I've got a few housekeeping items, and we'll get into it. So your video is automatically turned off, and so is your audio. So feel free to move about, grab a tea, a snack, speak freely, uh, make yourself at home. Um, we do have ASL interpretation on this Zoom meeting tonight. So uh, anyone who's interested in following along with that, we recommend that you pin the video. Uh, so to do that, you just need to find Richard Martell in the speaker view, hover over the box that he is in, find the three dots in the top right hand corner and pin the video. Uh, if for any reason you have trouble viewing the presentation once you've done that, when the presentation is running, go up to the very top right of your screen uh, and select the option that says, let me get you the exact wording, uh, swap video for shared screen. So we're really looking forward uh, to your feedback, your questions, your input, positive or negative. Uh, these are the kinds of things that challenge us to think about things differently. So we, we're definitely looking forward to that. Um, our only ask is that the comments submitted through the Q&A are respectful and kind. Um, and now we'll get on to the good stuff. So I'm just going to give a brief introduction of our speakers. Tonight we have Jennifer Angel, uh, President and CEO of Develop Nova Scotia, Peter Bigelow, Vice President of Planning and Development at Develop Nova Scotia. We've got Margot Young, Principal, Senior Planner and Landscape Architect at EDM Planning Services. Omar Gandhi, Principal at Omar Gandhi Architect. And providing ASL interpretation this evening, Richard Martell and Debbie Johnson Powell. Over to you, Jan. Thank you, Janine, uh, and good evening. Uh, thanks to each of you for uh, joining us this evening. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the Develop Nova Scotia team and our partners, and I know many of you are joining us from uh, Mi'kmaq, the unceded territory and ancestral homeland of the Mi'kmaq Nation. Uh, our relationship is based on a series of peace and friendship treaties between the Mi'kmaq Nation and the Crown dating back to 1725. Uh, and in Nova Scotia, we are all treaty people. At Develop Nova Scotia, our work is pretty simple. Um, we're trying to build places that people love. We're trying to build places that contribute to our economy, that contribute to our resilience and our uh, uh, impact in the environment in a positive and regenerative way, uh, and places where everyone can belong and participate. We know that if we build places for people, we will attract people. And we know that to build places for people, we need to build them with people. And Peggy's Cove is, is no different. When we began this project a couple of years ago, uh, we approached it with a genuine desire to do the very best we possibly could for Peggy's Cove, for its residents, for the people of Nova Scotia and for visitors, uh, many of whom uh, visit Peggy's Cove when they visit our province. Uh, as I said, we've been at it for two years and we've been privileged to hear from many people uh, and those conversations have shaped this plan. Over the past two weeks, We've heard that some people don't feel heard and lots of people don't like aspects of the project. Uh, and let's be clear, no public engagement is perfect uh, and it's never the case, or certainly I've never seen it, uh, that everyone agrees on a design. But in an effort to really dig in for meaningful engagement with community, which we still believe is the right focus, we did spend less time with the broad public engagement. Although as we've been uh, sharing, we certainly feel that we were transparent and that we did engage the public and we absolutely invited public feedback and we value it. We also believe that the initial renderings that we shared of our plans really did not give a good sense of the location and scale in particular of the viewing uh, deck and that uh, this caused concern, uh, widespread concern. Uh, we have since released uh, better images, uh, including an aerial site plan. And tonight you'll see uh, uh, new images uh, that we think uh, tell the story better than, than those initial images did. I think it's important that we're working from um, you know, what we're in fact proposing. We take all of the feedback seriously. 
Um, we value your time and effort and energy, and we're really happy that you've joined us this evening to share your ideas and also to ask any questions uh, that you may have. Uh, we will be considering all of the information that we receive and hear tonight carefully, uh, and we will report back to the community following uh, that consideration. This would be easier to do in person. Um, the webinar format is somewhat clunky, uh, but we're gonna do our very best to make it work hard for us all tonight. Uh, we'll begin by uh, taking you through what's been done, uh, the rationale for decisions that have been made, what's proposed, including, as I said, updated images that we think will help illustrate the plan. And then we'll open it up to your questions in the chat, which I believe Janine will moderate and we'll respond to your questions, including questions that we've received uh, in advance. Thank you for those. You know, lastly, I, I'd like to say, you know, we know that you love this place. Uh, we do too. And we hope that we can build understanding and ultimately plans together that achieve what I think are common objectives of a beautiful and natural and accessible place at Peggy's Cove, where everyone can safely uh, enjoy it now and in the future. So we'll dig in. So there are some table stakes. Uh, I think there's a slide, there we go. There are some table stakes to this project that I just wanna to, to set it up with. Um, we think they're important that they're, they're well understood. Uh, the work in Peggy's Cove needs to address these table stake objectives. Public safety, which should surprise no one. Uh, why this matters and that it's needed uh, as, a, as an area of focus in Peggy's Cove. Accessibility, uh, and we've talked a little bit about this in some of, on some of our social channels. That's not just about access, but really about providing uh, an exciting and elevated experience uh, for everyone. Engagement. So it was critical to us that we worked very closely with the community who live here and steward this land 365 days a year. It was critical to us that we consult with First Nations, the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, and we began those conversations back in 2018 and they continue today. And it's really important that we respect the environment, both from the perspective of, of coastal resilience, um, but also uh, given that it is this majestic and beautiful natural environment that draws many people to Peggy's Cove that the interventions we we're proposing were as light touch as possible to really limit the impact uh, on the natural environment there. So we will be building an accessible viewing deck so that more people can experience Peggy's Cove. Uh, and we know this particular uh, piece of our plan is one that's attracted a lot of interest. Uh, so tonight we're really interested in your ideas on how we can make uh, that element and indeed the plan in general even better. What did we miss? Um, you know, how can we make the experience even better for, for more people? Next slide, please. So it is a tourism icon and some of the funding that's been directed towards the project uh, is through what's called the Tourism Revitalization of Icons Program. Uh, it is among our most visited tourism destinations in the province with more than 700,000 people visiting in a typical year. 50% of all first time visitors go to Peggy's Cove. And while this is a, a different year, uh, we're confident that visitors will return and continue to grow in numbers. And tourism is an important um, segment of our economy and one that we believe uh, merits investment. But it is a community first. Uh, and the way we build uh, even places for visitors is always about building places for locals first. Uh, because when we do that, not only do the places we build, uh, are they more authentic because they reflect um, the local culture, uh, but we also know that that's what attracts visitors. Uh, visitors want to go where the locals go uh, and they wanna have authentic experiences. The planning has been underway for two years, uh, but the project wasn't fully funded. Uh, the opportunity to direct funding uh, to, to this project uh, became available through the capital stimulus funding to support COVID recovery in, in the summer and fall. 
Um, this also presented, uh, you know, because tourism has been uh, has been well down uh, through this COVID period, an opportunity to do uh, construction when it would have the least amount of impact uh, on visitors and on community. So we asked residents if we should move move forward uh, given this opportunity, uh, and there was a consensus among those who responded that the time was right, which meant we had to move quickly. And so here we are. Um, Again, thank you for taking the time to join us tonight. We appreciate your interest very much. We look forward to your ideas. Uh, and now I'm gonna turn it over to my, call, to my colleague, Peter Bigelow, our Vice President of Planning and Development at Develop Nova Scotia, who will begin to take you through the plans and how we got to now. Over to you, Peter. Sure, thanks, thanks Jen. And as Jen mentioned, um, uh, we came to this project, to Peggy's Cove, through um, the uh, tourism revitalization of ICONS program. And that's a $6 million investment by the province in those places that are that so attract visitors to Nova Scotia. And they are the places that we all love. Examples of those would be uh, the Cabot Trail, Cape Split, the Halifax waterfront, Lunenburg waterfront, um, and of course, and of course, Peggy's Cove. <clears throat> so, Originally, this was identified by tourism um, as uh, not just as an icon, but there were concerns um, coming out of the tourism industry um, because they're, they were starting to see a decline in satisfaction with, um, the visit, with visiting um, Peggy's Cove. Um, so that's where we started, but that's not exactly um, uh, where we went. And I'm gonna explain that a little bit. Um, next slide. When we went to Peggy's Cove um, and began walking around and that's how we started. We walked around and we just talked to the people in Peggy's Cove, visitors and residents. Um, what we found really, really opened our eyes. We didn't have a clear understanding of just the lack of infrastructure um, that was in this village, not just to host the 700,000 people, but also infrastructure for the village. We also hadn't understood that the village in terms of population had been in decline. It had gone from 150 people down to 36 when we, were, when we um, first arrived. We also didn't understand um, just the threat that the ocean actually um, uh, uh, posed for on the village itself. We're all familiar with the waves crashing around the lighthouse, but none of us really knew um, just how much um, those storms, what a threat those storms were to the village itself. And in fact, some of these images that are from Hurricane Bill, uh, uh, and you can see just how, how much flooding happens right in the core of the village. And that is a threat to washing away um, important elements of the village. We also didn't understand um, the, uh, the, the, uh, how much those iconic elements such as the fishing sheds and the fishing stages were beginning to be removed um, and uh, we're in need of repair. I'm going to flip to the next slide, which is just one of these elements and uh, ask uh, uh, Deb, tell me that you pushed the um, play. Um, this is just simply three minutes speeded up of what a typical day in Peggy's Cove is like like where you have all of us, we, because we're visitors too, um, uh, coming to Peggy's Cove. And it's, it's you know, this is pretty compelling, um, uh, we feel. Um, so next slide. So what we also found was there was a, a lack of accessibility, uh, a lack of washrooms. Um, there is a only one public set of public washrooms in the uh, in the village. Um, the village was actually providing washrooms in many cases um, uh, for visitors. The roads were in bad condition. There's a lack of public space. Almost all of Peggy's Cove is actually private land. Um, most of us don't realize that. When we're standing out on those rocks, 
um, next to the lighthouse. Sure, we are on Government of Canada lands immediately around the lighthouse, but when we moved to the left or to the right, we are quickly in the private. Um, also, the problems in terms of parking. Um, uh, with that many folks um, all coming to this tiny place in vehicles, because that's pretty much the only way to get there, um, parking is at a premium and presents an enormous, enormous challenge. Next slide. So that's when we determined that instead of it, this just being a, an exercise in, in uh, looking at tourism and revitalizing this as a tourism icon, what we really needed to do was take a more comprehensive approach. Tourism is part of it, visitation is part of it. And as I've said, we are all visitors. If we are not part of the people who, who live and, and have claimed to live in, in Peggy's Cove, then we are those visitors as well as those people who come um, uh, to Nova Scotia as tourists. So with that, what we did is we um, engaged uh, Margot Young's team um, at EDM, and she put together a, a multidisciplinary team to work with Development Nova Scotia and work with um, uh, the community. Uh, um, uh, and key invested stakeholders um, to make this, uh, to come up with solutions for the long-term sustainability of Peggy's Cove. So I'm gonna turn it over to Margot and she's gonna walk you through that planning process. Thank you, Peter. The master plan had um, four components, the typical components, background report, consultation, a design, and then a testing of that design. And then obviously ongoing iterations as more and more feedback in the design progressed. As Peter pointed out, um, you know, as through all that background work and all the studies, and it's amazing how much Peggy Co Peggy's Cove had been studied. What was going on on the ground is a living community that was um, where people were leaving and it was sort of crumbling as we continued to study and look at these people. I think they described themselves as a fishbowl community in the early work. Develop gave us a mandate of creating an authentic place and they really drilled into the design team from the very beginning that, that the Peggy's Cove plan had to belong there. It had to be of that place. And to achieve that, we really needed to understand the residents of Peggy's Cove and what made this, what they did on the land and how it made this place so special. And so authentic place required us to not just study people, but to listen to their, their stories and how they were viewing what was going on in their community. And so it began with a lot of private uh, conversations, and I mean private within the community. That's the 40 residents invited to sit down and have some conversations about, you know, some what were really difficult issues. What did it mean to them? And so uh, I'll give you just a few examples of the kinds of things we heard about, you know, the being embarrassed because because all the garbage cans were overflowing or, um, you know, people walking into their homes because they didn't realize that people live there. They thought it was a museum or um, how it felt to have people peeing behind their shed for heaven's sakes, right? I mean, the community was literally hosting all of these visitors and they really didn't have the supports they needed. And so we started there with all of the issues and all of the problems. And then we moved to consultations, next slide, about vision and, uh, and what could, um, would they be willing to continue to host visitors? And by that, that means Nova Scotians and people from away. Uh, and also, would they be willing to, what kind of supports did they need to achieve that? Next slide, please. And so, um, the, these are the kinds of questions, a lot of table work, um, uh, storyboarding to come up with answers to these. And ultimately what it resulted in was a vision. Next slide, please. And I'm gonna spend just a moment on the vision because there has been, I've had the privilege of being in, you know, living and breathing Peggy's goal for two years really. And um, there's been a lot of iterations of the design solutions, but the vision that was uh, came out of these consultations, these early conversations, a lot of time is spent on the wording, and it's, it's basically three statements that um, as we moved out of these community consultations and moved broadly, th these this vision has has stayed. 
and has been supported and is the, the consistency. And so there's three statements. And the first is what Peggy's Cove is. It's a world-class fishing village where people feel, feel proud to live here, families thrive and residents benefit, benefit financially from hosting the world. And there's a few uh, uh, items to that uh, that are throughout all of the planning work that fishing is considered to be the background and the backbone to this community that they want to be proud to be here not embarrassed by how many people are there and their inability to host them well that they want to be able to raise families and to have the community grow again and also that the residents can benefit financially in some way so this just isn't people from Halifax coming here, you know, hanging out of their community, but then going back to have a meal somewhere else. So there is some benefit to them for hosting that. So the second statement is about the, um, uh, what does Peggy's Cove need in order to be able to carry out this hosting function well to support them. And so that is, um, these words were visually authentic and beautiful. You know, they wanted the plan and the work to make sure that it was, came out of that place, but also that a lot of this infrastructure they desperately needed that Peter described was addressed. And finally, there's a piece that um, we, um, I was actually completely unaware when we began the work and that's the Peggy's Cove is not governed within the Municipal Government Act. They don't have a community plan in the same way the rest of us do. And um, so they, um, they don't have, the same opportunities to participate in planning processes that the rest of us do. There is a Peggy's Cove Commission and that there needed to be some work so that the community could be able to participate better. And that included that when visitors came, they were learning about the real Peggy's Cove, the Peggy's Cove that uh, these long standing families that have lived there for generations know about, not some kind of trumped up tourist story. Next slide, please. Peter, do you want to speak to this one? Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, so so the engagement has been um, uh, something we've, we've focused on in this presentation and also in the public uh, comments that we've been getting back. There's been some concern about uh, consultation with Mi'kmaq community as Jen indicated um, that started in 2018 we, with the planning, we did an outreach with all Nova Scotia chiefs and band councils, inviting them into the planning as well. Uh, and we also had participation um, through the in Nova Scotia Indigenous Tourism Network. And that came through us through the South Shore um, uh, Tourism um, uh, Network as well. Um, the, uh, in 2020, well, as we were beginning to uh, um, contemplate con uh, the construction uh, we also uh, did an outreach to Nova Scotia chiefs and bands of councils again, indicating that that's the stage we were at. Um, and just in December, we were contacted by uh, the Assembly of Chiefs KMKNO to um, that there were there was interest um, from from the bands, uh, and we met with them and we continue to meet with them on issues such as uh, um, archaeology. The sweet grass has been has been something that has been highlighted. Tourism site interpretation on the sweet grass itself, because that has been a, a topic of conversation um, through the Mi'kmaq Friendship Center. We have been able to be in contact with um, people who actually harvest in that in Peggy's Cove, and I can say that you know the harvesting in Peggy's Cove has existed for a long time, and in modern times that has been you know it's it's the people who uh, the community and the people who pre presently live in Peggy's Cove and the Mi'kmaq, they've been able to do this and, and make this and make this this work. It happens without much complication. Uh, um, but the concern was uh, from the from the Mi'kmaq community was what were we building on those areas? And we've been able to confirm from those harvesters by taking them out on site and having conversation and also uh, exploring the area with botanists that we are not on those on those sweetgrass harvesting areas. Um, also, in terms of consultation and engagement, you know, widespread, there are uh, many agencies that we had to contact. So, you know, safety, 
matters in Peggy's Cove. We had meetings with the first responders, both police, uh, EHS and fire, um, lands and forestry who look after the back lands, um, community culture and, and, and health, the Department of Fisheries, you know, social environment. There's a long list of folks that need to be uh, um, part of, of the planning and the execution of these projects. Throw it back to you, uh, Marga. Next slide, please. So Peter's, uh, you know, big long list of um, agencies there, they, all of those groups set up as design criteria for us, all of those groups from DFO to Lands and Forestry, they all bring TIR, they all bring concerns and criteria to the design work and, um, and parameters for that the work has to uh, uh, contain. The vision was floated with all of those groups and through those groups, uh, that vision, we, we had sign on with it. You know, the groups are like, okay, this is a community first um, vision and we can get behind that. We also then went to tourism operators more broadly. Um, and, and that was to get a much better understanding from um, people who get a lot of feedback from visitors about the visitor experience, what the design needed to have, what the plans needed to have in order to um, support the 333 tourism around it in particular, but also more broadly um, the, the tourism that the, at the port in terms of the cruise ships, the tour buses that come through, etc. There's a lot of groups and individuals that really um, came to these sessions and talked to us about how a, a visit to Peggy's Cove was part of their business plan, even though they lived and worked someone, somewhere else. And all of this, next slide please. All this culminated in uh, something we called a design week and uh, we went to design week, it, it was um, an opportunity to do the planning work in the community right in Peggy's Cove. Uh, graciously, the VIC was opened for us and we were able to be there, it was open to anyone, it was advertised, many residents attended most days. On different days, we had different topics and different sessions where we we address different topics like you know some of the tough ones, parking, buses, those sorts of things, uh, infrastructure items, as well as um, you know the, the community stories, the how the rocks are named, all those sorts of really wonderful deep uh, interest that came from that work. Um, I was joined in this work with Robert Mellon, a vernacular uh, architect uh, who is a professor at McGill, but also Development Nova Scotia staff was there with us on the ground day in, day out, drawing, helping, engaging in these sometimes difficult, sometimes really fun conversations as to how we might move things forward. And community members opened their homes and allowed me to stay there. And so I'm grateful to them for that. One of the key outcomes, next slide please, from this work was something we called um, the pattern book. And the pattern book was a largely the work of Robert Mellon, but went back and looked in very detail at how, the, um, how architecture and landscape are created at Peggy's Cove. What are the forms and structures and placements in the landscape? And so next slide please. This is um, an, an image of some of his work that came out of that. And this pattern book in terms of how structure, shapes, forms, sizes, placements, all of that uh, is, is used and underpins all of the design work as we went forward. And these, um, these drawings were actually uh, developed through Design Week, uh, actually touring and measuring and visiting buildings. I want to also note that uh, Omar Gandhi's uh, studio was also participated at Design Week and also helped us um, bring the sensitivity of the community. We, we want to add an extra bedroom. How do we do this? So some, some of them are modern sensibilities to living, uh, creating a living community as opposed to just replicating a heritage uh, community. Next slide, please. And so the master plan uh, ended up with a, a series of key elements and interventions. You can read them there on uh, your screen. So I'm not gonna go through them in detail because I, we do describe them here a bit and I don't wanna <laughs> re re uh, replicate myself, but there's a few things I'd like to say. The first is that the master plan was ideas and concept designs, and those have been going through iterations uh, ongoing uh, because the work is so sensitive. and. 
so for example, um, a, a project uh, is, is very fine grained in Peggy's Cove. Every small intervention is seen. And so we are really doing a lot of, you know, design on the spot changes as we build to make sure everything is fitting in as best as possible. So the iterations are ongoing from these big concept ideas in the beginning. Um, the reflecting of, they do reflect the vision, but they build in a lot of the modern requirements to host 700,000 visitors. And that includes accessibility. That includes things like modern safety expectations and washrooms and those sorts of things. That is built into each of these projects. The idea that they can be forward and flexible. So um, elements are, are being done with uh, small components embedded in them so they can be expanded on and taken further. And I'm going to rest just for a moment on the last piece. Again, um, uh, there is an act, the Peggy's Cove Commission Act, which governs this place. And there is a, a commission and there are there is need as well for uh, changes beyond design and physical changes that were identified, including you know, management strategies for public lands, both right in the cove and within uh, the broader ecological environment that uh, the Peggy's Cove land site sits within. The um, projects were, are in four key categories here. Obviously the transportation and visitor services, which includes parking facilities, and washroom expansions and traffic management ability, climate adaptation and environmental quality. Uh, again, dealing with the sewage issue, but also improvements to the road, to the breakwater, all of these elements so that the uh, climate change can be accommodated and I, items to improve the visitor experience as well. Next slide, please. I'm gonna pass that back to you, Peter. Sure, thanks, Margo. So, we did the plan and then um, quite frankly, uh, my, in my imagination, um, uh, I, I never contemplated that we would be um, executing the plan um, so quickly. And as, as um, because oftentimes these, the, the pace coming out of these plans is, is can be quite slow um, often um, these plans are sometimes sit on sit on shelves and sometimes they're taken off, but it's years later um, and implemented. Um, but what we what we saw here because and Jen alluded to it um, because of the situation we were in with the with the pandemic. Um, and as we shared this plan and we should uh, we shared this plan um, uh, through governments and through uh, other agencies and people began to say, yes, this is something that, that should be done. Um, uh, we, we found a momentum. And as Jen said, you know, we went to the community and said, if we went for this, we, should we do this um, uh, now being um, this summer and this fall? And, you know, it's kind of like the old adage, you know, should we peel the bandaid off or should we tear it off all at once? And with tourism down over 95%, you know, I think the, the community gave us good advice and that is do it now. So um, next slide, please. So one of the things that we looked at was the, um, you know, what should we do out of the plan? And what we settled on is we, we need it. There's always a first things first. There's foundational things that need to be done. And some of them are just not sexy. They are things like doing a sewage treatment um, uh, plan um, and uh, for that, for the area, a wastewater management strategy, um, putting in pipes for that future um, sewage treatment um, facility that's going to be, that is required. It's about raising the road against uh, uh, climate change. Margo's going to take you through all those, um, but I think that it's kind of important to understand that um, we had an opportunity in front of us and we seized it. And I think, um, uh, I think we're gonna be better for that. Um, the, uh, uh, and if you turn to the next slide, please. Um, just to the slide on uh, um, that shows the DeGarth building and crowds and, and the Zoom. Um, so, uh, what we did is we actually just in the same way we did in the planning, 
we um, uh, worked with vested stakeholders um, on the implementation and the implementation projects and the um, and the uh, the detailed design. And so again, community was involved, key stakeholders um, such as lands and forestry, TIR, whatnot, who, as Margot said, have standards that that need to be met. That was all part of it. Um, so now I'm going to throw it back to Margot. I think if I'm correct, we're one slide behind there. Deb. There. That's the slide I just spoke to. Good now. Now I'm going to throw it over to Margot and she's going to take you through some of the, the project elements. So um the work is currently uh, this currently underway uh, is broken into a series of what we call tender packages in the business, which is um, you know the design being done and led by different groups. The items outlined in purple are uh, being led by NSTIR currently, and that includes raising the road through the cove. It includes uh, the boardwalk work. We call it boardwalk, but it's actually being designed to look like a wharf. It includes an expansion of the IC parking lot. And it also includes um, the improvements to the breakwater to help protect the community. So those are the packages and the work that you see underway at the moment. Also, there's two other tenders, one's in um, uh, yellow outlined, and that one uh, is for the DeGarth Studio restoration and also for uh, the washrooms and a new public space in that location. And the one that uh, has attracted most of the attention is the uh, look off and that's a uh, tender area down uh, with the red outline. So those are the three areas. And what I thought I'd do is just kind of walk you through highlighting some of the projects and some of the work that's taking place within each of these components. So if I could have the next slide, please. So the road work is a raising of the road, uh, and, and this is being done as carefully as we can, one of those interesting grading challenges I've ever had, so that the road is raised enough to become uh, secure as the sea level rises, and so we're shooting for 2060 in terms of the road raising that took place here. But at the same time, we still have to be able to get into people's homes and have uh, the water drain out of their yards. And so the lowest point uh, has actually been raised um, uh, 1.2 meters, so it's actually quite a lift on uh, on the road through Peggy's Cove. There is um, the work is extending basically from the VIC all the way down to the southwester, and includes uh, a lot of defining of the road. So it's actually it's narrow it, when you're driving it. It seems, but it's actually there's no real definition, so it's not clear where pedestrians can go. So there's new sidewalk and there's new wharf work to make it really clear for people and give a really lovely generous spaces for walking through the cove. Their uh, road is future proofed in the sense that there is pipes in the road so that there can be a future sewage treatment solution for Peggy's Cove. Um, and so a lot of that work was very detailed work done, you know, working with each resident that's actually impacted by this to make sure that uh, things could actually happen for them. Uh, next slide, please. The breakwater is, is a really lovely story. It, it sits actually on private land and the community had built their first breakwater by, um, and then it had blown out in one of the hurricanes. And so to protect the community, they actually sold cookbooks in order to raise the money and build the breakwater. That breakwater um, is likely uh, only sufficient for current storms, but certainly it uh, isn't sufficient uh, on a go forward basis in a climate uh, change scenarios. So the new breakwater is future proof to about the year 27, 20, 2070, 2080. It includes uh, uh, significantly lifting the height of that and also the width of it, uh, again, on private property. The uh, stone that we're using as much as possible uh, is locally sourced, either from where we've removed um, uh, stones, uh, where, the, where the asphalt is being removed, because there's actually a pulling back of the road up in the southwestern area but also from where we're expanding the VIC parking lot so that the color of the rock work and the type of rock is, uh, is compatible with the community. Next slide, please. 
The VIC parking lot, uh, the, the original master plan actually had an offsite parking lot and this lovely trail and bridge that I, I thought was beautiful uh, into um, uh, the VIC and really working with the community and with lands and forests who are very concerned about the eco ecological uh, air integrity of the area. Um, we really then started to look really hard at how can we really maximize the existing parking lot? How can we get more cars in there? How can we set it up so that uh, we can get more buses in there? And so we worked really hard on this design to keep the parking lot hidden, but at the same time really expand its ability to be functional and useful. And that includes dedicated handicapped accessibility spots, the ability to park up to 40 buses here, and also a design that allows for loading for a future um, road train or other um, um, golf cart solution to take people from this VIC down to through the cove and into the lighthouse area. So a lot of work went into this. Uh, the community was actually really very involved in helping us understand and, um, and, and build this parking lot and get it uh, designed in this way. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the Degar Studio uh, is one of these really beautiful heritage uh, fish stores in Peggy's Cove uh, that is actually owned by the province and had been falling apart. And it, it was in desperate need of very quick action in order that it not be lost. And so this is a heritage restoration of this building, working with heritage photographs. The work is being done by Zapp and Robert Mellon. Uh, and I, uh, I'm very excited to see it lifted and set aside right now and to be put back on, on cribs uh, in order to keep that authentic character of the cove. Next slide, please. And at the same time, in putting the um, store back, we're able to work with residents about where and how they might want to add and repair their existing fish stores as well. So the DeGarth Studio sets a template, if you will, for how we might be able to incorporate in heritage locations a rebuilding of the fish stores and possible reuses for those, and also how wharfs can be used to create both boardwalk built but an authentically designed as war. Also uphill from that, also in red, and you can kind of see the green grass area, is a, a community space. One of the things we, Peter said in the beginning is, is that most of the activities in Peggy's Cove are taking place on people's private property. And so the DeGarth property is, was a really wonderful opportunity to make space for visitors to picnic to there's a washroom building as part of it opportunities for there to be some music and other activities taking place in the cove painters setting up on the wharf all those sorts of things making space on public property for all those visitors to be uh, contained next slide please And so um, the accessible viewing deck is also one of the projects that is currently um, underway. Uh, the red line outlines the current location of where uh, traffic circulates and it's actually the public land, if you will, although the area inside the loop is also owned by uh, government. In terms of you know, what is there, it's basically a one way loop up by the Southwester for traffic. And when we think about the visitor experience at the rocks and we were working with how do we achieve all of these really amazing um, objectives? Uh, how do we, um, uh, and by objectives, I mean the uh, having a place for visitors, how do we achieve that? And at the same time, uh, not do anything to damage this place. So that, you know, that is the mandate we are working with as well as trying to make a place that was accessible. And so, you know, when you think about going out onto these smooth, warm, white, beautiful rocks and you don't just see the ocean there, you know, you feel the ocean and there's these short views to the lighthouse and the ocean and the long views down the coast. And how can we offer that experience to people who are unable to walk on these rocks? and at the same time, not diminish the experience for those who are out on the rocks. And that was really the design uh, challenge that was put, put to us. And so our initial master plan, next slide, please. 
it was actually, you know, an, an idea of actually, <laughs> you can see very like, okay, we're just going to take a ride out there. And the de the initial deck originally extended right out over, over those rocks. And this idea that you could be way out there and you could look down and see the ocean splashing, maybe through a glass floor or something. I mean, the, the original ideas were very much out there. And then, of course, you know, the reality of, you know, how do we actually support that structure and the strength of the waves and the need to, um, uh, you know, be more sensitive so it's not as visible, you know, really started to work as the design began its iterations. And so slowly but surely, it got pulled back to the current footprint. Next slide, please. And so, um, you know, Omar Gandhi's group, so the blue outline here now is the current pull back from my initial great gesture out over the ocean uh, that Omar has come up with. And he was given a, an even tougher task. And that task was, how do we create that experience, that feel of being out over the ocean with actually out, without going there? And, you know, we brought Omar Gandhi uh, to the design team because in my opinion he is one of the best form givers in the province the, that ability to use shape and form to deliver that authentic experience of being on the rocks without actually having to be all the way hanging out there and um, so I'm going to actually let Omar take it from here thank you Margot good evening everyone uh, my name is Omar Gandhi. I'm an architect based in Halifax, and my team helped to design the accessible viewing platform at Peggy's Cove. Next slide. The new viewing platform flows through the new space at an elevation that keeps both people and infrastructure above the height of waves and safe from the impact of rising sea level while also being, uh, being below the horizon line from the lighthouse. Next slide, please. This improves safety and keeps people away from high risk locations on the Western side of Peggy's Cove. We aim to replace environmental, visual and acoustic pollution created by vehicular traffic with a linear extension of the landscape. The viewing platform provides a continuous level surface that is fully accessible, a mixture of solid and transparent sections of guardrail help to frame views and promote safety throughout the platform. The cantilever, cantilevered look off, which doesn't touch the ground and allows for play and shelter underneath the structure, seeks to provide the experience of being out on the rocks and near the water, but in a controlled and contained manner. We're providing a brand new perspective for those visiting again and a potential lifetime memory for those who were formerly unable to navigate the rocky terrain. Of the full distance from the lighthouse to the edge of the current road, the new look off at its most encompasses 13 meters of the full 66 meters, all of which exists below the aforementioned horizon line. The 13 meter cantilever flies over approximately two fifths of the full downhill portion of the Cove Gully, which is a danger zone in the area. Next slide, please. In plan, you can see how the look off was designed like a slice of pie level with or beneath the lighthouse horizon line with the furthest point encompassing nine degrees of the full 360 degree view from the lighthouse. The side walls of the look off are at an extreme acute angle receding from view. Next slide, please. Conversely, the existing driveway loop has a full 46 degrees of vehicular traffic all above the lighthouse horizon. Nova Scotia has always been famous for its landscape, but imagine just for a moment, we became famous for the way that we treat one another. Next slide, please. The materials palette is entirely comprised of durable materials that can be sourced from local suppliers and fits within the larger context of materials and textures found throughout Peggy's Cove. The boardwalk pushes and pulls with the natural rock outcrops to be respectful of the landscape and flow with it in large gentle sweeps and curves. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Green spaces are expanded with planters and new landscape zones that use a mixture of native plant species to support and sustain the local ecology and educate a larger audience to the unique biosphere of the coastal barrens. Rock and art installations will be used to anchor these new landscape spaces. 
Thank you for joining us for this discussion. I hope uh, the additional information provided some insight into the lengths that we took to provide a design strategy, which is both beautiful, accessible, and gentle. And back to you, Janine. All right. Thanks, everybody. Okay, we're going to move on to the Q&A portion. So please bear with me. I'm going to do my best to go through these in a way that, that makes sense. Um, okay. Jen, I'm going to toss the first one to you. Uh, this is a question from Ricky. Is the plan fixed or can it be changed? No, so the plan is not fixed. Um, the viewing platform, I, th I think folks are aware, is, is currently a market for tender. Um, and, uh, you know, and should there be a compelling reason to do so, then we would have the ability to make adjustments to that. Thank you. Peter, this one's coming your way, I believe, from Catherine. The Nova Scotia Business Minister has clarified to various parties that no environmental impact assessment was conducted for this project on the exclusive use of the old footprint of the old road loop. I would like to know why this justification is contradicted in the request for quotation that developed Nova Scotia submitted for tender on January 15th. The drawings on page 58 indicate clearly the privately owned lands outside of the original footprint will be overlapped. How can this lack of an environmental assessment be rectified at this late stage? The only thing I can do right now on, on Zoom um, with, with the, the question um, is ensure that people understand that uh there are no triggers for the work that we are doing in peggy's cove that we, there are no there's no work that we're doing in peggy's cove that envir that triggers an environmental assessment under the environmental assessment act um we can dive into some of those details and uh, the details around page 58 or, or or whatnot um so we're happy to do that and, and we can get back to that in, individual if, if she can make herself known to us thank you Can you talk a little bit about how and when surrounding community members were involved in the process? Jen? So I can, I can take that. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, certainly we've, we've gone to, I think through this presentation kind of really told people about the extensive consultation that we did, the, you know, the intense engagement that we did and the collaboration we've done with, with folks. And Margo has pointed out that uh, Design Week was certainly open to anyone to attend. We did have people attend from well outside the community, from Halifax, from um, around the uh, St. Margaret's Bay Loop. Um, people who came out because they were involved, wanted to be involved because of the industry, people who came out because they just live nearby and they um, uh, come here every day. And uh, it's just part of a part of um, them living in the area. So a lot of that was through the design week um, uh, opportunity. And just a quick follow up to that, Peter. Um, I many of the residents who live on the Peggy's Cove Road, roughly 648, according to Maggie, uh, feel that they were blindsided by the proposal and they're wondering why they were not included in the consultation process. Yeah, I think we've, we've again, we've, we've ex explained the, the concept of, of why we had had such intense discussions with the with the community and the community members, um, again, folks from the vicinity were were invited um, to Design Week. Uh, it was on our website. It was pushed out through social media, um, uh, and um, and uh, we didn't put things on the on the on everyone's door. Primarily, and you know, I'm going to have to be kind of straightforward with this, there's been a lot of 
Mark, we've talked about a lot of the plans that were done in, in Peggy's Cove. Um, uh, we made a deliberate decision to ensure that the community of Peggy's Cove um, was the focus of our conversations in terms of detail. So people from the surrounding area could participate, sure, but, but we've had, um, you know, we've had, we've paid particular focus to the um, folks in Peggy's Cove, primarily because it's their community and they're the ones with one street that uh, has 700,000 people um, traveling down it. Jen, did you want to weigh in? No, I mean, I think that is absolutely right. There, there's lots of people outside of community members who care about Peggy's Cove, um, but no one cares about it more than the residents of Peggy's Cove. You know, so um, as Peter said, it was pushed out through social channels. It was in media to mass market. Um, uh, and so people were absolutely welcomed and embraced uh, when they participated either directly through design week or, or otherwise through notes and comments. Um, you know, so it certainly wasn't an, a deliberate attempt to exclude anyone, but it was uh, also a deliberate uh, effort to uh, really drill into conversations with the community members uh, who, who again, uh, steward this place um, for all of us 365 days a year. Okay, I'm gonna take a little break and uh, ask you some questions from the ones that we received in advance. Um, this one is, can you speak to the extent to which the viewing platform will change the land level of the existing loop? Currently, the ocean side is considerably lower than the restaurant side, allowing the rock mound to hide the restaurant uh, from that particular view. Sure, let's throw that to Omar. Yeah, sure. I mean. What I can tell you, uh, and you know, you can really see it in that section drawing where you're looking at both Peggy's Cove, the lighthouse, and the lookout, uh, kind of in a you know straight-on view. Um, the the level of the walkway surface is actually at the point of where the lookout is, 0.1 meters higher than it currently is, so 10 centimeters higher than it currently is right now. Um, so in fact, it's actually almost, almost negligible uh, in terms of changing the height. Um, uh, it really is going to be, uh, you know, quite a seamless aesthetic. Uh, and, you know, looking at those rocks in the background that separate, you know, the turnaround from uh, the restaurant itself, I mean, that's still going to be the focal point. In fact, I'd say it, it'll become even more of a focal point now that the cars and buses uh, aren't going to be cutting off that view. Thank you for that. Um, I believe this was covered in the presentation, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, can you speak a little bit to how the Indigenous community was consulted and uh, how the question is, have they approved the proposed developments? Jen? I think Peter is probably better to speak to that. Yeah, sure, certainly. We had a, a complete slide on that, but just to, to re reiterate, certainly um, uh, Mi'kmaq community was, was invited to be part of the engagement, through engagement, um, be part of the planning process. And then during the construction, um, uh, also to uh, participate through either engagement or consultation. Uh, and they have chosen consultation. We've, we've had meetings. Uh, we have, uh, we will continue to have meetings um, in order to um, uh, hear and address any issues, but also to kind of advance the, um, the idea of, of uh, the Mi'kmaq and the Mi'kmaq's presence in Peggy's Cove um, without going into a great deal of detail. Um, this whole vicinity is, is rich with the history of, of the Mi'kmaq people, um, both in terms of their presence before we arrived as Europeans, but also um, uh, after that. Um, so traditional uses, but also looking forward to um, 
the, telling the story of the Mi'kmaq, having the Mi'kmaq have an opportunity to tell the story about their relationship um, with Peggy's Cove, with the land, both traditionally, but also from a modern perspective. Uh, so that's really where we're engaged and where we're trying to trying to go. And and I think uh, both um, Develop Nova Scotia and, and the people we're dealing with, the agencies and individuals that we're dealing with are, are um, all joined together in that effort. Okay. Sorry. Uh, okay. Peter and Jen, I'll leave it up to you as to which one, uh, which one of you would like to answer this question. But the question is essentially, um, is it possible to pause any further construction until Nova Scotians have a fulsome understanding of the environmental, social, economic, and cultural impacts, as well as the sustainability of the $3 million project that is about to be tendered for construction? Accessible view. Yeah, I, I can take that in a general sense. And Peter, you can feel free to fill in any, any um, gaps. Uh, it is not our intention to pause uh, construction. Um, we believe the project is well supported. That does not mean everybody likes every part of the project for certain. Uh, and as we've uh, already answered, um, you know, there, there are still elements that are, that are able to be um, tweaked, uh, should there be a compelling reason to do that. Thank you. Peter, this one's for you. Are the private lands either adjacent to or encircled by the viewing deck being acquired through land sale or expropriation? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so well, I think I mentioned that how much of Peggy's Cove is, is uh, private land. And um, certainly uh, the road is, is a, a, a right of way owned by the province. Um, uh, but to do even some of the works that Margot talked about, um, as well as the viewing deck, we have uh, acquired pieces of land or the rights to build on pieces of land. And that's always been through um, a fair market um, exchange or value um, approach, so purchase. Uh, there's one parcel of land um, that has no owner, no current owner. And so the province is, uh, has to go through a process um, to quiet, what we call quiet that title, um, ensure that there are no claims on that land. Um, and they do that through actually an, ex uh, an expropriation process, but it's sometimes termed a, a friendly expropriation, but they are not taking lands away from a current owner. It's an abandoned piece of property. Uh, this question is related to accessibility standards. So Peter, I'm gonna send it your way as well. Um, is there a standard or best practice for inclusion in public places that guide design or our design, I guess? I'm going to turn that over to the to the designers. Um, because yeah, I mean, like yeah, yeah, no, I can I can jump in and, and say that there are basic, um, I, I would say, you know, universal accessibility standards. Um, you know, my office just finished uh, the municipal building in uh, Bridgewater for Lunenburg, and we actually achieved the Rick Hansen standard, uh, which is essentially to bring Canada uh, to an accessible standard, a high accessible standard by 2030. And we did that already. So it's important, you know, um, I know that a lot of people were talking uh, at one point um, about, you know, the pathway that leads down to Peggy's Cove, the lighthouse and that sort of thing. I think what's important to understand is, um, you know, a surface that's wide enough for a wheelchair doesn't make it accessible. The slope there is very steep. Um, I believe it's one in 12 is the slope that's required for a wheelchair. It might be even more than that. Um, so, you know, it's more than just being able to, you know, wheel yourself uh, from one place to the next, but to do it uh, in a way that is enjoyable and easy and safe. Um, so really we are using those standards um, and, you know, to be honest, we're pushing the boundaries, you know, we are making this project, um, uh, you know, almost uh, an icon for this sort of movement. And I think, uh, I think it's important. 
Am I able to speak? Am yeah, I sure. Sure. So also I wanted to say that um, it's not even throughout Peggy's Cove, the extent of the accessibility. There are areas where it's just really too steep and we would really have to change the road and the character to achieve those standards. And so uh, I, I mentioned with the parking lot, the option to be able to go to the parking lot of the VIC and be able to, from there, transfer to uh, some other form of transportation, a road train, golf cart, sort of, so that you could actually get through and go places too. So there's a variety of different ways we've looked at as to how to make it accessible. And it's been a, it's been a really complex part of the project in order to maintain the, uh, the integrity and character of the cult. Yeah, and the only thing I would add to that is as part of our process, um, Omar mentioned the Rick Hansen um, standards, we've engaged the, with a, uh, um, uh, for a audit by um, a, uh, an expert in the Rick Hansen, Hansen um, standards for the, uh, for the deck project. Um, that would include the deck, the washrooms, all aspects of it. Got one follow up on accessibility. Uh, will seated or small people be able to see from the viewing platform? Yeah, and you know, I think um, that was really the impetus behind the screen that we're using. Uh, there's a beautiful stainless, um, very, very thin wire, extremely durable uh, screen that allows people to look through it. Um, uh, almost seamlessly and you know quite frankly you know in comparison to plexiglass or glass which smudge or break this is actually a very popular uh, way to uh, to create that kind of barrier in the least invasive way um, I would say in terms of you know further developing this plan it's a real interest of mine and my practice uh, to push the boundaries on accessibility and if there are ways that we can make it work a little bit better I think that's where um, you know, there is some room for change. Uh, and I'd love to speak to some more people about that. The next question was if you considered plexiglass. So you anticipated what I was coming with. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing with plexiglass, you know, there's the cost of glass, there is the uh, breakability of glass with strong winds and, you know, people touching it and smudges and, you know, who's going to clean it and uh, you know, plexiglass oftentimes changes color slightly. Um, and then all of a sudden it becomes something that, um, you know, needs a lot more upkeep. So, you know, it, it was entirely things we considered. Um, uh, and, you know, really the, the way that we're going is by far um, the most seamless way to go. Thank you. I think I've got all of the main accessibility ones. So I will move on to, there are a lot of questions about the viewing deck and they're all, again, I'm generalizing, but they are all kind of asking the same thing. So I'm just gonna do it as one question. Um, is it possible to scale back the viewing platform to eliminate the cantilevered section? Um, and a follow-up to that is, is it possible to use only natural materials? Well, we are using wood. Um, as the entire deck surface, um, it'll be a pressure treated wood that you know you see on boardwalks. Uh, we're using steel and concrete because, of course, uh, you know it needs to withstand uh, the climate. It needs to withstand the weight of people. Um, you know, as you can see by the new renderings uh, that we've shown, um, which really will look like the end product. Um, if you look at the work of my practice. You know, it's a, a similar aesthetic. Um, you know, it will gray uh, and weather with uh, the landscape and it will eventually look and feel like it grew out of it. And that's always the goal with our work. Uh, in terms of the uh, cantilever, um, you know, really, and I, and I have to say that I'm unabashedly proud to say that we've created a very special place for people who can't get out there uh, to the rock and who can't go towards the lighthouse. This is a special place. Uh, we haven't said, you know what, here is where the road ended and this is where you look uh, the way they may have before. Um, this is really to add to the experience of being out there. Uh, it will be absolutely magical. Um, and I really think that shortening it a little bit or all the way back um, really just takes away from that magic. Um, I, 
I haven't, you know, really heard or seen um, any reason to do that, to be honest. Peter, do you have anything to add there? No, just, um, you know, that's, that's what strikes me about that, we call it the nose, um, is it, it's been very carefully designed and we've tested it. Um, and it's always a balance between, um, you know, uh, does it intervene in the landscape? Is it offensive in the landscape? You know, you know, does it block views? Let's just put it plainly. Does it block views or does it look like it shouldn't be there? And, um, uh, you know, and how, you know, that's one of the functions of that is how far it protrudes. Um, the other is, do you get a meaningful experience out there? And, you know, you've looked at it and you're taking advantage of that natural, that, that naturally existing opportunity to put people out towards the gully, not over the gully, um, but towards the gully to, to the sweet spot, to that sweet spot location where they actually, if they look to the right, they've got, uh, they can have a very, they feel like they're over the water, but they're not. Um, it is a safe place that we don't have, we've done the calculation, the waves will not come up there and affect anyone sitting on that, uh, on that, um, uh, that viewing platform. Um, but it, when you start to pull it back, you, you lose that experience really quickly. Uh, and you might as well be standing on the road. Um, and that's really what we're, we're trying to make sure that, that, that there is that special, special experience. And we've also uh, thought yeah. a lot about natural landscape. You know, that's one of those things. I think that's a little bit of a gray area that isn't necessarily understood. Um, around the current road right now, you see a lot of rock, uh, rock that's placed on top of one another. There's a large uh, circumference of rock that extends from the road as it stands now outward. And that would be underneath um, the lookout, that's a retaining wall. And that retaining wall was always put there to protect the asphalt road that was put into place. Even the grassy landscape that's underneath the lookout, that's not natural either. So, you know, I think we've, one of the wonderful things about the cantilever is that was our attempt to do this as gently as possible. You can see in section that it really kind of flies out and feels like an extension of the landscape. And in plan, you can see that it's angled in a way that it really blocks as little as possible. And then underneath it, the land continues to grow. People can go underneath it. You know, it becomes a fun place to be. Um, you know, I, I really think that, you know, the, the term natural landscape, you know, leaving the natural landscape alone um, is an area that I think people in this case might not understand, but we've, we've really taken a lot of time to consider that. All right, Peter, I've got one more for you, which you might pass off. Um, do you have a 3D rendering where people can view and rotate to see how everything is planned to look? Oh, you're on mute, Peter. You're on... Yeah, I can, I can pass that to Omar. We, we, we always work in 3D. Um, and uh, Omar, you might speak to um, what you have and how you've developed the plan. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure, uh, you know, what develops plan is with this. Of course, we work in three dimensions. We use Revit and, you know, the renderings were made and, you know, a multitude of softwares to really, um, you know, get, give you a really realistic look of what it's gonna look like in terms of rotating around and allowing you to play with it. Um, I think that would depend a little bit on um, you know, budget, to be honest, if there's budget to really create these illustrations uh, to do it. And, you know, I think what the objective is as well. Yeah, I think that if there is a model that, that, um, that it, it would be used to be tested, and if we can find a way to make sure that uh, it can um, be used and, and somehow figure out how to transmit that to folks so that they can they can um, better understand it because I can understand the 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 the, the question. It's always those three D those three D models that you can move around are um, are are very useful. So let us take that away and explore it and see what we can do. 
Okay. We have a couple of funding questions. So, uh, Jen, um, I'll just ask one of them. There are a couple, but I think this one sums it up pretty well. Uh, the first speaker of this presentation referenced the monies coming from tourism revitalization funding and COVID relief. I would like clarification on that funding. Um, so maybe just speak to the funding for yeah. the project overall. Yeah, so, so there are a couple of different sources of funds for this project overall and different elements benefit from different funding sources. Um, I believe we have that breakdown on our website. If not, we will provide it to um, uh, to this group. And I should say generally all of the questions that remain unanswered at the end of the call, I think our intention and please confirm this communications folks is uh, we will we will provide a transcript of all of the questions and all of the answers, including ones we didn't get to on the call. We'll take those away and answer them and share them uh, with all participants on the call. Um, so, uh, so Peggy's Cove has had funding from the Tourism Revitalization of Icons program, which is a, a Tourism Nova Scotia um, uh, led fund. Uh, the ACOA has contributed uh, to portions of the project. There has been provincial stimulus funding, um, which is part of COVID recovery. That's separate from, I think someone mentioned there's a federal COVID uh, recovery fund. That's not what we're referring to. This is capital allocated by the province of Nova Scotia um, to help um, for, for investment in infrastructure to, to create economic stimulus. Um, and did I get everybody, Peter? Did I miss any funding? I think that's it. But we, we will provide uh, all of the funders and the amount of the funds um, uh, in the answers to the questions that we distribute. Thank you. Okay, we've got a couple of community questions. Uh, so Peter, these, or Margo, these are probably coming your way. Um, oh, apologies. Not so, I'm going to ask more functional questions first. Uh, how are EDM planning chosen to participate in this work and are they subcontractors sub of the Harborside engineering tender? Peter. Yeah, I can answer that. So EDM was the lead um, uh, consultant on the planning, um, on the planning phase of our work. Uh, and Margot had, as I said earlier, had assembled the team. Um, uh, Harborside is the lead on the uh, uh, engineering, uh, what would we term the detailed design that leads to construction um, phase of the work. And EDM is a sub um, with uh, to Harborside as well as Omar Gandhi. And there are others that are, that are involved in it as well other agencies, these things take a multidisciplinary approach. And it's, it's, it's very common for, um, uh, for folks to put together a consortium um, to that brings the expertise that's required for um, every project. And they're always, always different. Now on to the community questions. <laughs> Uh, I love that you listen to the people in the community. How many residents did you listen to? This is multi-part, so I can repeat them. How many <laughs> residents did you listen to? Was it before COVID? And how have you consulted with all of them since the viewing platform? Uh, the work on heritage structures, the digging, the blasting and construction. Oh, you're on mute. There's a lot of questions within that one question. I'll try and Janine, you keep me on track, okay? I got you. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, we're we're pretty proud of of of. It's not. We're pretty proud. We really enjoyed working with the community. Um, it was an amazing experience. Um, there were times. There were meetings, and we've had multiple multiple meetings. Um, some of them are have the whole community gathered together. And as I said, one time there was one meeting where my comment was the only two people that aren't in this room right now are the two people that needed to be in bed by eight o'clock. Um, so, uh, you know, we've had a tremendous turnout by, by the community. A lot of the work that we do uh, also involves talking to smaller groups within the community and with individuals um, because we're dealing, as Margo pointed out, we can, we, sometimes we have to deal with an individual property that has, it has a 
that individual has very particular um, uh, concerns or, or requirements. And, you know, that's one of the fortunate things about working in Peggy's Cove is developing relationships with those, with those community members. What was the other component of the question, Janine? Uh, was it before COVID and what have you done since COVID and during construction? Oh yeah, COVID was a step. So you saw in some of those images that we actually did have a lot of face-to-face -face meetings. Um, uh, and then, so that was all pre-COVID. Right after COVID, we were, uh, came into play in the restrictions and limitations on gathering. Um, then we of course discovered what everybody discovered, which is the Zoom um, sessions. Um, uh, some folks didn't have Zoom and the community um, made sure that those people who didn't have Zoom um, either w could um, uh, maybe a few of them in the right numbers could gather together um, so that they could participate. And um, we have, there was a, um, I, I mentioned that there was an advisory committee that we, that we developed for the detailed design. So that advisory committee functioned and there were there, the community actually appointed um, members to that advisory committee on the detailed design. So that all uh, it represents part of our feelings with the community uh, itself. And um, then during construction, because, you know, we, we have, you know, the mate having a lot of different projects going on, individual projects going on in that tiny, tiny community, um, we wanted to make sure we made it as easy as possible. So we had a direct feedback loop with the community to the um, folks on site, as well as we had our, we've developed a, uh, a community meeting every two weeks on Zoom where, where there are community updates. And we also post the construction update on the BIC and elsewhere in the community. Janine, could I also add that it, it, with respect to the viewing platform portion of that question, uh, we did a walkabout with the community members uh, and, and others actually attended as well. And we had staked out at that time how far and where it was going to go. And we had staked out the uh, nose, the, the viewing deck. Uh, so there was a, uh, we've actually done a walkabout through the community showing exactly how far out all aspects were. And the viewing deck was staked with flags and also the extent of the wharf structures and things as well. Thank you. Okay, I've got two questions. One, one was mailed in in advance and the other one is on the group. Um, and it's related to growth of tourism, uh, continuous growth in Peggy's Cove. Um, so, I'll go with the one that's in the live in the Q&A. Uh, with additional parking lanes, walkways, services, and facilities, what is the estimate of the total number of visitors that could be accommodated and, and is growing visitation, I guess, an objective? Yeah. Peter, you're on, you're on mute. I'm sorry. I keep pressing it. <laughs> uh, I'm not very good. <laughs> the um, uh, yeah. So um, in terms of growth, we had a lot of conversations around growth um, with all all people that we talked to. Um, with the work that we are doing, we are primarily accommodating. Um, we are we are solving the um the problems that currently exist there is in when we did like traffic studies and whatnot we found some really unique situations for example is that at some days 50 percent of the traffic in peggy's cove is that people can't find parking they don't know where to find parking and they go up the road and back down the road two trips and then they don't even get out of their cars so is that a visitor no that's not the visit. That's not a visitation to Peggy's Cove that, that uh, we want to see. So um, what we've been able to do is um, introduce a traffic management system um, that, as well as uh, you saw in that video, we've got conflict between pedestrians and 
um, vehicles that slows things down. Um, so the, the concept that we're working with right now is actually, we had what we called, I think it was over 50 fail days, 50 days where we could not accommodate the visitors in, in Peggy's Cove. And by our calculations, we have reduced that fail, that fail day rate down to about 20. And the community said, we're okay with that. We're okay with it being really, you know, kind of there being a level of congestion. Um, you saw on our plan, we had, we had uh, plans for additional parking um, elsewhere in the cove. What the community advised us is like, let's, let's um, when we're determining what to move forward with, let's take pause on that and let's, um, let's see how, effective we can make the traffic management and with um, uh, some sophisticated cameras and whatnot um, that that allow um, a piece of software to communicate to folks through a sign um, where there is traffic, where there are, um, or sorry, not where there's traffic, but where there is parking, we can reduce the amount of traffic on the road. Um, so it's kind of an iterative approach, if you will, like it's uh, try this, see how it works and then in the master plan there are there are there are uh if it do does work great if it doesn't work then we would move to other um improvements that could accommodate more visitors so right yeah, now we are, just... we are still we are still really targeting um that seven hundred thousand level but the plans are um uh if if uh if visitation continues to grow, there is a plan to um, um, uh, uh, accommodate that. One of the other things that's happening is, you know, some of this pressure is coming from crews and um, it's gonna be interesting to see how crews responds um, to COVID. Um, so that's an unknown right now, as well as uh, there are efforts to try and bring other tours for crews, um, for cruise passengers. Um, to other parts of Nova Scotia within striking distance of, uh, you know, day trips within striking distance of those uh, cruise docking facilities. So that may also help alleviate Peggy Scope. Sorry, Jen. No, no, I think that was really good. I just add, I know, and I know Ross Jefferson's on the call here somewhere. I wish I could figure out how to let him speak to it because Discover Halifax um, is thinking a lot about. Uh, you can bring him in. You know, can we? I, I wonder yep. if I'm, we're putting them on the spot. Well, why don't you try to do that and I'll share some, some general thoughts. I mean, I think part of their strategy and they, they've consulted very broadly, uh, likewise on their new integrated tourism master plan, um, you know, is about the sustainability of growth. So the quality of experience, not just growth for growth space, but uh, uh, growth sake, but how do you uh, really, really ensure that the quality of the experience is not eroded and we're moving people kind of around, um, you know, dispersing them, as, as you said, Peter, within the cove by, by getting some of the cars, vehicles off the roads and buses off the road in a better traffic management program, you create space for humans to have an enjoyable experience. And a, a lot of humans can fit in the space of one tour bus. Um, were we able to bring in Ross? I believe so, yes. Are you there, Ross? I think I am. Uh, can you hear me and see me? <laughs> we can. Did we just interrupt your dinner? Sorry to throw you on the spot there. You, no, you did. And I'm glad that you did. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was uh, obviously listening in uh, to the presentation. And, you know, the question, if I uh, recall, was um, uh, about sustainability of, of tourism, about uh, the increased growth in tourism. And we do know that tourism is one of the fastest growing industries uh, in the world. Um, we've raised in the development of our tourism master plan and the consultation uh, in this region as well, the concerns, and we've heard the concerns uh, that, that you've also heard uh, in your, your planning uh, around uh, sustainability, around safety, um, uh, and around all of these issues. I really think that the designs uh, have obviously uh, considered all of these and really adjusted for a lot of this, but more holistically, uh, also within the community, we need to be looking at growth overall. Uh, we have opportunity for continued growth in tourism, but we need to be very careful about uh, where, uh, where we're placing this. So one of our strategies is around dispersal of visitors. 
uh, that would see uh, future growth uh, going to other parts of the community and uh, in working in tandem with the development of new tourism icons. So um, it's, it's paramount uh, to this. And I think um, the, the question is a really great one as we look to the future. Uh, our approach in our new tourism master plan is about a community first approach, very much one like I think this has been based upon the designs that you have. If you build great design for communities, they're great design uh, for the visiting community, but it is community first. And uh, I just wanted to commend uh, the, the, the designs and the, uh, the work on this, uh, uh, meeting the objectives that we put forward uh, in that tourism plan. Thanks, Ross. Okay. This is a bit of a functional follow-up to that, but um, are there improvements planned for Route 333 to sustain the additional increase in traffic? So I know this is something that uh, the province is looking at, not directly through Develop Nova Scotia, but there are our colleagues at uh, Transportation Infrastructure Renewal are always looking at um, you know those those uh, highway capacity and, and feeder roads. So. Uh, we don't have something to speak to today, but we can check in on the status of that investigation and report it back uh, in the answers that we share with the group. Unless Peter, you have more to share on that? No, not really. It, the question was raised, you know, the, the, um, uh, when we were dealing with Peggy Scove about many of the other issues, such as the free, you know, the, the, the trunk route, as well as, you know, access into the backlands, those kinds of things. Um, and uh, our, our master plan, we, we had to kind of focus on, we felt compelled to focus on um, uh, the Peggy's Cove village first with what we found. Um, but certainly everyone we talked to talked about some of the issues and opportunities that um, and constraints that are um, uh, uh, that you can find on that uh, Peggy Scove loop, um, and they're large, right? And and by by being better at Peggy Scove, we think that that helps to be a catalyst for some of these other improvements. Thank you. Noticing that we are over, we are past 7.30. Um, so I'm going to wrap it there because we have 120 questions all in. Um, I'm not, I've answered a lot of the functional ones, but we do have still about 65 open. So we are going to take this away and put together something that we can share back with everybody who was on the call. And we'll be sure to add any of the new questions that aren't currently reflected on the Q&A that's on our website as well. Um, Thanks everybody for your time and for caring so much about this special place.